Hi there. Thanks so much for joining us once again. I'm Jeff Smith. We appreciate you as always spending part of your day with us here on Leading Edge. It is our chance to let the stories of the day breathe a bit. And boy, oh boy, did we have a moment to all hold our collective breath this past week. That is after nine tornadoes plowed through the region more than a week ago, creating a trail of destruction through a number of counties, including right here in Lucas County. I want to give you a look at some of the graphics that our WTOL 11 weather team put together looking at the one that blew through. First, Look at the one that touched down in Point Place. This was an EF2 reaching speeds of up to 130 miles per hour. That is what it looked like at that moment of impact on the radar. Let's go to the next one, Ottawa County. There, the real trouble was just south of Oak Harbor. You see all the indicators as far as lightning strikes. Yeah, there were thunderstorms going on, but then right where the arrow points down, that's where the tornado hit. That one once again reaching those high speeds. And right there, the signature on the one in Huron County, just south and east of Norwalk. Today, we wanted to talk about the response, the reaction, and the decisions that were made to help people in the recovery effort. Let's welcome in my guest with you today, Director of Lucas County Emergency Management Agency, Abby Buckup. She joins us as well as Lucas County Commissioner Lisa Sebecki to kind of, I guess, flesh through exactly what we experienced. So, Abby, even some of the meteorologists around town said this kind of thing, this storm outperformed and it came out of nowhere, catching everybody by surprise, including those in your position. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, we rely on the forecast experts in National Weather Service Cleveland. They're the expertise. Lucas County, yeah, we do operate alert and warning systems for the county, but we rely on the watch and warning products put out by National Weather Service. And National Weather Service will be the first one to tell you this was a rapidly intensifying storm that came right in from the Monroe over the lake area. Yeah, me meteorologist Chris Vickers and I were talking about it, Lisa, this week, and he said if you looked at this thing 10 minutes before those tornadoes touched down, it didn't present itself. Maybe I'm getting the timing wrong, but he says within a half an hour's time, it didn't present itself as becoming this serious. Now, to Abby's point, the governor was here mm -hmm. earlier uh, last week. He even said he wanted to talk to the National Weather Service, didn't he? Sure, he did. And he said he's actually going to send a letter to the National Weather Service. And I know that our wonderful Senator Sherrod Brown mm -hmm. has sent a letter. Um, and the county commissioners are putting a letter together today as well. Um, as we're taping here to send off to the National Weather Service. Just asking them simply, hey, warning. I mean, here it is 2023 and we're talking about getting warnings for storms like this. Abby, walk us through, uh, I guess, the process. So this happens and uh, help us understand, help the viewers understand emergency mode and the emergency agency and what it goes through to react, to respond. The night of the tornado on Thursday evening, uh, I received a call from Lucas County 911. They're the ones that sound the sirens. Mm. And they were receiving a lot of calls from uh, citizens in the area reporting weather events. And our first uh, call is to the National Weather Service. Uh, Lucas County 911 had already been in touch with National Weather Service as well. They were actively monitoring the situation. At that time, they were not seeing any kind of criteria that was indicating a watch or a warning at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, we were on the phone with them a, uh, a couple times reporting what Lucas County citizens are seeing. They're looking at what they're seeing on the radar. Once they did confirm a tornado watch for a tornado warning right. for the area, uh, which it was not issued for the Point Place area. It was actually issued for the Harborview, Oregon, and Jerusalem Township area. Mm -hmm. At that point, we began our policies and procedures to sound the sirens. And the sirens are one tool in the emergency warning toolkit. Lucas County Alerts also went out at that time as well. And we have a countywide warning system. So all sirens were sounded at one time. So we uh, do recognize that it is uh, realistic that in, uh, individuals that were in the Point Place area, when we sounded the, the warning sirens for the uh, eastern metropolitan area, m some of the severe weather had already passed or taken yeah. place in Point Place. What did you think when you saw some of the video clips coming in? Obviously, everybody with their cell phones, the ability to take some of those videos, especially the one that was right there at Souter and Alexis. I mean, jaw dropping, right? Absolutely. And our emergency management agency, we were in the field conducting preliminary damage assessment. Some of those uh, information was relayed to both the state and National Weather Service to kind of assist with their determination of what EF yeah. uh, or tornado confirmation it may be. And until you're in the area walking through the neighborhood, 
it's hard to truly fathom uh, what it looked like. Yeah, Lisa, I want to get into some of the recovery efforts here in just a bit, but I, I do want to talk to you about just being a commissioner, being out there on the ground immediately after. What did you see? What did you experience? Sure. Well, actually, when the event happened, I was on vacation in Missouri, and some of us grew up in Missouri. I've been around tornadoes my whole entire yeah, right? life, and military. I've been through a couple of hurricanes, so. Um, understanding the importance when it came out, but the, the minute that I heard about it, we started making pre preparations to head right home. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I did, is I was home by Friday and in the neighborhoods, uh, but in the meantime, trying to get cell service and talk to folks, but unfortunately, the towers are down because of the storm. Right. So I had to rely a lot on the communication we were getting from our team, and Abby and the EMA folks did an amazing work there, and we're so proud to have them as our employees. But um, just trying to get that information, sometimes it's kind of a little difficult. So sure. really social media was what was really kind of getting me um, prepared and getting me home. But on that trip home was already putting actions in place and communicating with our teams yeah. on what we need to do. When I come, when we come back, I want to talk about resiliency. I've heard that word used a million times. I also want to talk about getting the help out to some of those folks who really need it. We're going to be right back right here on Leading Edge right after this. Once again, talking about that tornado recovery and the efforts and reaction. And Abby, I was asking you before we went to break, or actually as we were in break, I wanted to know kind of when do you start Monday morning quarterbacking the reaction and the response? And you said, we're already kind of doing it. Absolutely. Um, the kind of after action recovery process, it starts as soon as the response begins. And uh, after any kind of emergency or exercise or drill even that EMA or Lucas County may participate in, we're looking at what went well, where can there be points of improvement, and a lot of things really did go well, and if there are points that can be improved, absolutely, that's something we want to uh, integrate into our plans and policies and procedures in the future. Give me one specific that you think went really well as far as the response was concerned. I think the partnerships that uh, the community has among governmental, non-governmental, and state and federal partners were yeah. really exemplified in this. Uh, Do you get on the phone, are you hammering the phone with uh, power companies saying, hey, what's the update here, that kind of a thing? Do you have to work on the behalf of the customers? Uh, we EMA kind of becomes that coordination or liaison between Lucas County nine, um, and Luke, I'm sorry, Lucas County mm -hmm. and the city of Toledo and partners. We were working very closely with Toledo Edison, who was working with all of their partners as sure. well. Uh, Red Cross and Engage Toledo two one one were uh, was sharing us any kind of information that they were hearing from callers, so we could identify what trends and what community needs there may be. And I yeah. think that steered a lot of the objectives for the community as well. Lisa, talk a little bit about, obviously money comes up, and before insurance dollars come in, the county came out and said this week that it was going to offer up some financial assistance to folks to the tune of $1,500 increments for families and or $750 for individuals. Kind of walk us through, how do you get to those figures? How did it go? Well, these, these are set um, guidelines by the state and the federal government through our PRC. And so uh, what we want to do is immediately get out there and get the checks. Uh, as we're taping today, uh, $41,000 worth of checks have been um, cut. And actually, as before I even came into tape, I was hand delivering those checks door to door. And we'll be doing that um, for the rest of the remainder of the time. So I'm going to give you a moment to tell people why you did that. I, I did that because I, you know, our community was in need and they needed to have, um, you know, food replaced in their home and um, be able to pay maybe some of those deductibles or high deductibles to get some repairs made. Now, as the weekend's coming on, we hear it's going to be hot and there's going to be some rain. So, you know, people need to get the resources into their hands. So I just felt that it was very important that we get those resources right to their hands sure. immediately. Uh, we're also, um, this uh, a lot of the folks that are on SNAP benefits, <clears throat> Their food stamps, um, when they came in to the library where we were housed at, and now if they go to Jobs and Family Services, if they're on food stamps too, they're going to be able to get their food stamp replacements because they've lost a lot of their food in their refrigerators and freezers through the power outages. And uh, so, um, and just the responses and being able to continue to talk to the community about additional needs they might have, mm -hmm. so we can continue to relay that to um, our team and then also into the state and, and the conversations with legislators and senators and the, and the governor. Yeah, what was the look on the faces you saw today? Um, and by the way, we're taping on Wednesday night, but go ahead. Tears. Yeah. Tears, um, 
and smiles, and this is the best um, person I've had come to my house today. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, and they're like, we did not expect to have the county going door to door to give those checks to folks. They yeah. expect to have to wait on the mail, which is sometimes a point place could be three, five, seven days with the mail system we currently have. Sure. Abby, as we, as we kind of, I guess, wrap up here and talk a little bit about the response and what we've seen, this could have been so much worse. Have you had those conversations? Absolutely. I think the number one takeaway uh, from the disaster in the area, there were no fatalities and no injuries. Yeah, absolutely, right? Yep. I mean, you look at that and that is a major positive in, in what has been a very tough time. What about the rallying point? I, you talked about communication being so key, not only between the partners, the county, the city, um, police, fire, all of that put together. How has it become so coordinated over the years? You, you've been with this organization for some time. How do you get to that point of being kind of a well-oiled machine? I think it comes down to uh, simply the partnerships that we have with governmental partners, but then also first responders. Uh, within uh, an hour, there was a command post set up, first responders from Toledo Fire, Lucas County uh, Fire Departments, Lucas County Sheriff's Office, and even departments from Southern Michigan were coming in to support, going door to door, making sure residents were safe. Uh, the roadways were beginning to be cleared. I think they uh, knew who to call and how to get a hold of them because of some of those conversations that we have uh, day to day and during uh, drills and exercises that we participate in. And as of our last count at, uh, I think, 6 o'clock on Wednesday night, we were told that there were only like five people who were still without power. So looking back Thursday to Tuesday to Wednesday, it's uh, given what we saw and an EF2 rolling through an area that has not seen anything like this for decades. It was quite the response and quite the, uh, quite the situation. But Jeff, I have to also say though, it was for the residents. Had the residents not really came together, because some might not have known their neighbor on Wednesday right? night, yeah. but they really knew each other by Thursday night, but cleaning that debris away, so the emergency services and so that the you know, Edison could get in to do what they needed to do mm -hmm. so that the forestry department, our county engineer came out with his crew to help um, clear the way. But had the residents not came together and started moving debris, yeah. um, everyone has said to me that it would have taken a lot longer to have done the cleanup to be able to get access to folks. So that just really shows the grit and the grind that we have in Point Place, yeah. but the grit and the grind that we have in Toledo and Lucas County. Absolutely. Well, both of you, we appreciate. I know there have been some sleepless hours over the last <laughs> few weeks, uh, but we appreciate the time. Thank you so much for updating us. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Stay with us. We've got more to come right after this. Welcome back. As always, we appreciate you spending some time with us. As June comes to a close, the month is one where we celebrate the start of summer. We commemorate the end of slavery and everyone is asked to live their life with a little more pride. June marks Gay Pride Month. I read one post this week that read, this month long celebration is an opportunity to celebrate the spectrum of gender and sexuality, all the while coming together to fight for widespread equality and justice in the LGBTQ plus community. I wanted to make sure that we didn't let this month pass without having an open and candid conversation about where we are as a community and a nation when it comes to pride and also tolerance. I want to welcome in my guest, a member of the N Northwest Ohio LGBTQ Plus Coalition. Kurt Land is joining us. Kurt, thank you for being here. And on the end there, Chairman of the Board for Equality Toledo, Joseph Wood. Both of you, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good to have you on Leading Edge. Let me ask, let me start off, and Joseph, I'll start with you. Give me an understanding of why being gay can be so divisive and such, I guess, a hot point of contention for conversation and also in politics around this country. It feels like it hasn't always been that way, um, especially since marriage equality passed in 2015. We saw approval of same-sex marriage jump from mid-30s to high 70s in a matter of months. Mm -hmm. I would say in the last few years, we've seen a lot of targeting and movement towards non-understanding and ignorance of the transgender and non-binary community. It's uh, less understood, even within um, uh, progressive communities. Um, I think I read last week that only about 25% of Americans know a, tra a transgender friend. 
And that misunderstanding and ignorance, I think, allows an opportunity for individuals to fuel a culture war by attacking ignorance. Do you think it's a, a naivete, if you will, as far as how how we've been raised, how we've how we've looked at certain issues? Kurt, I'll let you answer. Well, that is a large question. It's too <laughs> to try and answer yeah. um, shortly. Uh, there's definitely a moral judgment there mm -hmm. about um, just the identity of being LGBTQ. There's still a lot of stigma around whether it's a choice or not, um, whether trauma causes the identity or not, which both of those things are not true. And so when people believe that it's a choice or that this has been caused by something else, then they feel less likely or less like they need to respect it or create space for it or yeah. even celebrate and affirm it. And so I work in the mental health field as a trauma therapist uh, at Fuse Trauma Recovery and I just see on a day-to-day -day basis how when you're coming up against this stigma, against this, uh, against your identity constantly being brought into question or voted on at the state and federal level, how this personally impacts you and over time creates trauma for someone. I, I wanted to show something we're seeing right there, and this is um, some video that we pulled out of New York actually earlier this week. This is. Uh, kind of the epicenter, if you will, back in the 60s mm -hmm. when, when the movement started as far as getting equality and rights. And Stonewall was one of those things that a lot of people talked about, a lot of people didn't want to talk about. But even this week, we saw damage done to flags that were out there showing, once again, support of Pride Month. I use the word tolerance, Joseph, and, and, and I wonder what you see as far as, let's Let's turn the focus, let's turn the magnifying glass back on Northwest Ohio, Southeast yeah. Michigan. Where do you see the tolerance here? We, Toledo is a welcoming city for LGBTQ people and families. We have a lot of work to still do. Mm -hmm. Why when, do you say that? When we are waking up as a community and whether it's youth or adults and we fear for our safety, whether it's at a gay coffee shop or a, a youth pride prom event, these are real concerns that we've unfortunately spent hours discussing and hoping to avoid, but also that we internalize and take back home. And this wasn't the atmosphere three or four years ago. Yeah. Gentlemen, stay right there. When we come back, we're going to continue this conversation. We're going to take our first break. We're going to talk more about Gay Pride Month and talk a little bit about, uh, I, I guess, where we go from here and what are the voices that we need to be hearing right now. Stay with us. We're back on Leading Edge right after this. Kurt Landis and Joseph Wood joining us here talking about Pride Month. I wanted to talk to you about just the month, right? And we're just a few days away from July hitting and all of a sudden Pride Month's gone. Joseph, how do we keep these conversations going? And is that something that is thought about? Because I, I said to you, I'm like, Black History Month, it's here, it's gone. So many other awareness parts. What about the rest of the 365 days of the year? Just quickly, there is value for recognizing, obviously, a Pride Month because it brings us all to learn the history, right? Stonewall started as a protest, as a riot led by transgender women of color. And we get to learn that through celebrating a month. Mm. But the work continues the whole year round, and that's correct. So, Even here? here? Even here in Northwest Ohio? Yes, Equality Toledo, we are always creating resources uh, year-round, hosting activism nights, creating educational opportunities, visibility events creating safe spaces, trainings for workplaces. These are opportunities uh, at, at equalitytoledo.org. And we are trying to engage not just our community, but people who may not know about our community who want to learn. Kurt, who is the voice? What is the voice we are listening to, we should be listening to? There's just so many voices in our community that I think often go unheard, which mm -hmm. is a large issue. Um, even just here amongst us, Joe and I represent some of the most privileged aspects of the LGBTQ community being white, cis, males. Um, so there's definitely diversity in voices that we need to make sure are at the table, including voices of our trans um, peers yeah. um, and people of color um, who are and, often and left I, out of the conversation. You, and I'll let you know, I mean, those are conversations we have here as well. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are many factions of our community that don't have voices that need to be heard, right? Mm -hmm. Not just what we're talking about here today. So continue on with what you were saying. Who, who is that voice? 
Yeah, so I mean, there's great leaders that we have in our local community, uh, city council people, um, people doing work on the school boards. Equality like Toledo does great work. The Northwest Ohio LGBTQ Coalition is doing a lot of great work and was just um, awarded $50,000 from the city of Toledo to improve health care in our region for LGBTQ folks. And so really, and the coalition is made up of such a diverse group of people, and that is the goal of the coalition, is to create a space where all voices can come together yeah. so that we can all talk about the issues that we're facing on a day-to-day -day and then utilize our power and numbers to create change in our region. I asked about the month ending out, but there are things going on throughout the course of the year. You were pointing to that, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the coalition meets monthly. There's committees that meet monthly. Um, the Affirming Healthcare Committee is doing the work every, every month, every day to create more affirming healthcare in our region. Uh, Equality Toledo just had a pride prom um, that was at the University of Toledo, which was attended and mm -hmm. a great success. Um, so yeah, there's work always happening in our community, not just the month of June. What do you say to somebody from the standpoint of you're having a conversation and you don't want them to be afraid to ask anything? Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you get that across? How do you be approachable, really? How do you let them know that you can ask? It, with, when we do Equality Toledo trainings, we intentionally design them to ask fearfully asked questions, mm -hmm. whether it's anonymous or not. Um, you know, to have those open and honest dialogues. How, how do we break down real stigma? We have real questions and yeah. Um, yeah. if it needs to be what stays here, stays here, but just have an honest conversation, people can leave with real results. In our last 15 seconds, I appreciate first and foremost, you both sharing this candid conversation. Is there a website we can direct people to? And it's gotta be quick. <laughs> <laughs> but there's the Equality Slater website and the Northwest Ohio LGBTQ Coalition has a website as well. We also have a Facebook page that you can find. Perfect, boy. You should be in TV. You wrapped that up well. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thanks.